Well, hello, Mr. Mahoney. It's great to see you again on this fine day. Happy New Happy New Year 2024. Can you believe it? We're already almost halfway into it. So I know. How, how you been Happy, so far? I'm good, John. Happy New Year. What a crazy week it's been already. What is it? The 10th or 11th today? It's the 11th, I think. 11th and already mm -hmm. insane stuff happening. And not just on the geopolitical, but on the financial side as well. So I'm really <laughs> hoping that you're going to share some of your little inside um knowledge with that because it's coming at me from all different directions john and i think we need to clarify some of this for people because <laughs> what we've been doing is once a month john and myself for the sake of the audience again but we get together and we have a little chat <clears throat> and john will shed some light on some of the stuff that's going on in this particular uh, arena so i mean where do you want to start today i'm, I'm really curious where where you are going to start today well, I'll certainly, I'll certainly do my level best to share the, the very best that I have, um, as always, with both of our respective audiences. And it's always good to work with you and collaborate because I think, as you know, we marry well between the geopolitical and the financial. They obviously go hand in hand. Um, personally, if you're okay with it, I think it, it makes the most sense to start with Iraq and then just yeah. kind of work our way down the chain, if that's all right. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, Iraq is something that's on everybody's lips really if you have been following what's going on with the rv the revaluation mm -hmm. worldwide you've got the currencies you're waiting for signs to tell you that we're getting closer and closer but i can absolutely assure you we are getting closer and closer john's going to give us a, a large helping a, a generous sprinkling of some facts about how we are uh, progressing towards this new chain of events john so i'm all ears buddy i'm all ears off you go take the mic all right. Well, thank you, good sir. Um, and you had made a good suggestion, mate, to um, uh, put together sort of a, a, a slideshow. So what I'll do is um, I'll start talking about Iraq, and then if you want to share that with the folks, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, we can I've, I've go got back. it ready. Are you ready for it? You want me to put yeah, it up already? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, you can start with it. That's fine. Okay, Absolutely. Cool. There we go. That's power. Oh, that's not it. Wait, there. there you go. That's it. There we go. So we can just skip through all that. <clears throat> yeah. I'll just go through the next slide. Um, so one of the, the things that I'd like to share with you and your audience are uh, what's going on in Iraq. Um, it should be Iran. Sorry about that. Iraq, Iran, and Zimbabwe. And then pivoting to Iran's importance in the whole equation, Saudi Arabia's importance, I think should be fairly obvious there. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about the China-Taiwan conflict, what's going on in the banking world. And uh, Texas has some new information on what they're doing with their own a digital gold coin that we can talk about and then just wrap it up from there as we normally do sound good well, there's, there's some great points on there though some of those i know about but there's, there's yeah some of them i don't <clears throat> so i'll be interested as well because again <clears throat> you see a lot of the audience think that um you know we're at this 24 hours a day we're not we do have lives we do have families we do have responsibilities but we are constantly being um, alerted to this. And it's always like a jigsaw puzzle, John. You'll get a piece over here, a piece over there. Your mic's off. You've turned your mic off by accident, have you? John, you oh, no, I just, I just muted it while you were talking. That's all. Yeah, you get piece, parts of the puzzle and putting them all together. This is why we, we'll do a lot of messages between each other in between these shows saying, what's your take on this and have you seen this? And with the time difference, there's nine hours time difference between us. Mm. So things change quite rapidly. The evening yep. for me, morning for you. So, yes, John, um, where are you going to go first then? You want the next slide? Please, next slide, if you don't mind. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, here's kind of the basics of Iraq. There's a gentleman out there, I'm sure everybody knows, Militia Man. <clears throat> you know, I check his information out. He's a good guy, family guy. He's got a whole team established and... You know, I think this is pretty much what he does, I would imagine, if not full time, at least a majority of the time, mm -hmm. uh, really reading extensively. He's, you know, he's got a Patreon channel. He's got a following. He they, does a really good job of, of doing the research, uh, deep dives, not just cursory articles, but really trying to. He's, I, I think he's a very left brain type of guy. He's very analytical and he studies this stuff extremely well. And he he's sort of tasked himself and his team with. <clears throat> trying to uh, not just read the tea leaves, but sort of the analytical and the, um, for lack of a better term, mathematical aspects of what's going on in Iraq. But he 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 understands um, the articles and what they're what they're trying to say. Because we also have to remember too, mate. You and I have talked about this. 
it's a it's a it's a misdirect, right? What what they tell each other in country and what they tell us, the Westerners, is two different things. You know, they're ideologically believe it's okay to lie to Westerners. Uh, they in their culture and their their religious beliefs, that's not a sin. As Christians, we know otherwise, but it just means that whatever they're telling us, typically the opposite is happening. But he's one of the people out there. My point is, it does a good job of <clears throat> reading the articles and getting the most out of the information that's disseminated both to him and to his team. And <clears throat> really what it comes down to, mate, in, in simplest terms is they're right now in a position, meaning Iraq, of getting all their reforms and their taxes and tariffs together at the borders that's all part of doing international business, which he talks about in the international private sector, <clears throat> getting their airport. They, have one of, they're, they're try, they want to tout themselves as one of the world's most uh, international airports. They're basically going to be, as you know, the next Dubai. They yeah. are working, having one of the largest buildings in Baghdad. And that's kind of a, a bragging rights thing, but that's a big initiative that they have to, to put themselves internationally back on the map. Um, as they get ready to queue up all these things, including the, the ever popular hydrocarbon law, Article 140, into Parliament, what you're going to see, I believe, is major war and chaos as Maliki, who's a, um, a holdover from 2010, really, he's an Obama holdover, says we know the countries copy each other, right? So Maliki's an Obama holdover, all of his Iranian proxy goons that are running the gates of parliament, not unlike here in America, not unlike in London, not unlike in Italy and many, many other countries, <clears throat> they're they're going to try everything they can to stop the RV because they know once this happens, that's the end of them. But um, what, what you haven't heard much of Malik, he's, he's like a little mouse making squeaks here and there, but he hasn't really ruffled his feathers yet because, again, once this gets into parliament, it's game on. Now, the good thing is Prime Minister Sudani is wholly committed to doing this. He's even willing to go so far as to pretty much risk his life to get this done. And we knew that when we found somebody who would be willing to do that, this was going to be in a really good position to happen. So what's also interesting too, David, is that um, the former prime minister, Abadi, is working behind the scenes with the citizens. He's making a very concerted effort to you know, get behind the citizens, get them their oil revenues. A lot of them haven't received a lot of their oil and credit back pay since I think 2007, 2008. So this is a long time coming. Interesting, it, it probably has indirectly nothing to do with it, but it's just interesting that how historical timelines recycle themselves. You know, 2008 here in America, 2009, you know, we had the bank bailouts. We had, uh, um, you know, we had a, a mini crash in the, in the real estate market. When I say mini compared to what we're about to face now. And here we are again, everything's coming full circle as it always does historically. So that, that's stuff that I would watch for with, uh, with respect to Iraq. <clears throat> Reuters put out an article here, as you can see, Iraq seeks quick exit of U.S. forces, meaning our military, but no deadline set. That's the key. This article is a little bit incomplete in the aspect that they're only telling you certain parts. What you have to do is fill in the rest. They're saying in the article that the, the caveat is that we're not leaving until 2050. But here's the bottom line. Sudani and the good Iraqi side of things, because there's always a good and a bad, want our military there. It keeps things stable. They still need us in the background, even if it's just 2,500 troops or contractors maintaining you know, a, a stable level of security and training for their Iraqi military to, to train them up. We're not going anywhere until this thing is done. Trump has mentioned that on Fox several years ago. Uh, I think it was with Laura Ingram that you know we have about 37, 38 uh, billion worth of dinars, but that's really trillions when you translate. And it's probably more than that. He was being pretty conservative, I'm sure, for publicity's sake. But um, we have a lot more than, than what we're, we're talking about publicly, uh, as always. So our troops are not going to go anywhere. In fact, what's going to happen, I think, is you're going to see a head fake. They're going to say they want our troops to leave, but then as soon as they implement these, these reforms and bills into parliament, that's when you're going to see all this chaos happen. And then, boom, you're going to see our military come in, just suck them right out, and you're going to see wholesale changes. It's, it's going to be um, a very suddenly type of moment, like Kim Clement always said. Nothing, 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 something. Yeah, you, you, need, the, you need the military there. People <clears throat> need to realize there's still a lot of squabbling going on between the, the Iraqis themselves. You know, we've got different yeah. fractions, different religious, slight like, twists on one religion to another. And also, the... Uh, 
politicians will net you can never get a straight answer out of them. If you ask them a yes and no answer, they'll come up with a maybe answer. So, mm -hmm. you know, reading between the lines, this is why people like yourself, John, come in as a vital role to decipher not only the, the codes, but also the nonsense and what a tiny step it would be. But in the long road of things, it's one step closer to getting where they need to be. Sudani's so doing a great job, actually. People are watching him very carefully. He's acting on behalf of the people because what John was talking about, this oil revenue, <clears throat> a lot of these people still had oil rights and then the war happened and then he lost it all. So they've basically been stolen from for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money that these people are owed and they know it as well. It happened in communist Europe, John, when the Russians came into countries like the Czech Republic or it was then Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Hungary. They appropriated a lot of property from the locals, but when they left, they got it back. Although some of it was better, it had been reformed and improved, but many of it was um, not workable anymore. A lot of them were turned into factories. But at the end of the day, the government had a responsibility to return what was stolen from the people during these times of occupation and or war. And this stands true for Iraq. So all of these large magnets of oil, oil magnets that were very involved with it before, will be reappropriated, uh, will be compensated let's say that for all of this so mm -hmm. it's going to create a tremendous amount of wealth and it's going to happen very quickly is what the it makes sense they're not going to do it slowly because you can't just rip a band-aid off slowly you know how painful it is um is that what you call them in the states we call them plastic band-aid no band-aids yeah. yeah yeah okay we call and, them and plas they, plasters they, in England have a different word from but anyway john next slide are you done with this uh, one well, before we go on, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry, but there's one other key, you made a very understated and, and an underrated point, which needs, I think, to be highlighted. You were talking in the beginning about how they do need our military. You're yeah. right, but there's another reason for it, because part of the Iraqis may want our military gone, but you got to remember, there's different factions within Iraq. There's the Kurds, the Sunnis, the Shiites, yeah. there's different, yeah. different subgroups. The Kurds don't want our military to leave because they've got problems with other countries. They've got problems with Turkey and Iran and Syria. They're hated around those areas. So they need protection and they haven't gotten their fair share to your point of the oil rights yet. So they're in no hurry for our military to leave until and unless this is done. And even after the fact, giving them ancillary protection on the back end. Yeah, absolutely. So. There's a lot of pluses for that. I what are the numbers of the uh, current remaining troops in Iraq, John? Do you know what the numbers are? I don't Obviously. know the exact. I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm told that it's somewhere in the 2,500 range between military and the contractors there. Which isn't a lot, really. I mean, it's just no. a, it's just a contingent force for for the sake of showing up to parties in uniforms, more or less. Considering how many figures, how many people were there before. So interesting how they can still. Uh, relatively maintain law and order. There's been a few little incidences of car bombs and market bombings, but this isn't anything to do with the American forces being there. This is all about squabbling with inside these religious fraction, fractions, such as you just said, the Kurds, the Shiites. So interestingly enough, some of them want them to stay, some of them want them to go. The majority of the power is being transitioned back to the Iraqi people so they can make their own decisions. But again, on this particular case, it's not a band-aid. They need to do it slowly because people get crazy with power and they have an opportunity to seize it. You could well end up with being another dictator in there instead of a democracy, like a real democracy, not let's rig the election democracy. And that's what the people need. They need a leader, somebody like Trump. And this is why I like this Sudani guy, because he is genuinely concerned about his country. He's patriotic and he has got, a, you can see, good intentions for the people. So... I hope he manages to get the job done. <clears throat> well, I think he will, and I think it'll be a, it'll be a combination of things. I mean, on a on a on a side note, David, I personally have always been frustrated with the citizens because it's it's a strange brew, right? It's it's a country the size of California, just under forty million uh, citizens or residents there, and you have an audience, you have a residence. Um, a contingency of people that's, I think, roughly, I was researching years ago, roughly 60% of them are under the age of 30. So it's a very yeah, young, 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 they're yeah. young. So they don't know about the previous history of the wars in Iraq and what they've been dealing with, you know, and 
But I do wish that collectively between the young and the middle and the older, they would galvanize and just rip those people out of parliament because there's only uh, 130 to 200 people in in governance there. And you've got millions and millions of you know residents that live there. They would only need 100,000 or 250,000 people to go in there and just rip them out. But um, but I also understand that, you know, there's. You know, it's it's uh, you know it's a courage, a faith thing, and you know, no, who wants to necessarily put their life on the line? But if they really did that, they could end this thing a whole lot sooner. But um, for whatever reasons, it's just needed to play out, unfortunately, this way. But the good thing is, at least you know, we're here, and we're seeing the the we're from going from a drip now to a flood point where it's just yeah. inevitably getting ready to happen. Like I said, I think people need to be watching for when the the uh, the HCL law and all the taxes and tariffs and all those reforms go into parliament. Because the minute that happens, David, um, you're going to see Maliki react. You're going to see all these things happen. We're going to talk about that a little more in a second with respect to how Iran plays a role pivotally in this. Um, <clears throat> but you'll see within days to weeks of those bills passing, you'll see everything happen. Yeah, I absolutely agree. We'll move on, yes? Yeah. Okay, Iraq and Zimbabwe. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> so um, it should have said, it should have, well, it's Iraq and Iran, yeah. But the, basically on the back end of, of Iraq is, you know, Ariel, who puts out a lot of great stuff on X, he's, he's pretty well in the know. Um, we've used his information on my channel before. <clears throat> he's talking about, you know, the CBA, CBA market, Central Bank of Iraq, basically, um, uh, needs to be international, which that's what they're doing. And as you can see in this article, you know, funding the sectors of trade, electronic payment, travel, and other sectors. Militia Man talks about all these things in, in great detail as well. Um, that in the pointing day, in the coming days, the, there'll be more measures. Again, basically, what he's saying is what we were talking about that they're queuing up, you know, all these taxes, reforms, and hydrocarbon law, all the things necessary to bring Iraq into international status. Personally, I think this was probably done a while ago, but it just needs to be done systematically in a way that aligns with the timing of everything else that we're seeing in the totality of the world. So he's just another good source for people to take a look at in terms of, you know, the overlying factors of what's happening inevitably in Iraq. Um, I wanted to highlight Zimbabwe a little bit because obviously we talk about the Zimbans all the time. I think people know should know how just how valuable that country is and how valuable respectively those bonds are from their own research and from our prior conversations. What's interesting about this is a friend of mine, John, <clears throat> gave me this article from Nelson uh, Chamisa, who is really the rightful president of Zimbabwe, just like Trump in America, just like Bolsonaro in Brazil and the like. Um, but you and I have talked about, David, that uh, Zimbabwe will be the breadbasket to the world. If you read this article, yeah. He says right here, um, we'll soon reclaim its breadbasket status, his words, not mine. They're going to lead throughout the world and in a gold nation, a wealthy nation, arguably the wealthiest in the world in terms of, of gold holdings and diamonds and many, many other things. Uh, but he's just giving you a big palm that he's uh, <clears throat> getting ready to come back in position. He is the people's president. And so uh, he's going to be the one that ostensibly brings Zimbabwe into a very, very bright future for him and for them and for the entirety of the world. On that that particular statement, to me, John, that's loaded with intel. If you just read it, uh, a great, a new great Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe shall soon reclaim its breadbasket status. Now, the breadbasket of the of the, the Europe is the Ukraine, so we know what's going on there. That made me leave there because. The word breadbasket has always been associated with the Ukraine. So I think that might be a little of intel drop. And then listen to the next part. We will lead differently and excellently. So a new leadership. He's not the president at the moment. A new leadership is coming in. We will feed the world, which means they will just share and break bread with their friends and the world because they are their friends. We will make and produce for everybody. So he's saying, guys, don't worry, I'm getting back into power. I'm going to put all of this and implement this new wheat, this bread basket. But this is my favorite part. Our nation shall be a gold nation, a wealthy nation. To achieve this, reform strong, 
professional independent institutions an accountable credit a credible capable state good governance peace unity and diversity tolerance healing and reconciliation upon being a god on a nation that mm. is a brilliant piece of writing and it's full of tips and uh, and hints of what's coming he's coming back there's going to be a lot of forgiveness he's going to say okay it's our responsibility as the world goes through this transitional stage to lead the manufacturing and production of um of bread basket products so to me that's an amazing statement and it's full of intel ready for the next one yes sir it's, i hope it gets better <laughs> that's, that's the plan next <clears throat> next we have uh iran's importance in all of this um, i personally think and I, I was discussing this with uh, uh sgn on this week and, and bill holter yesterday that um a lot of people we're going to talk about saudi arabia in a minute i think everybody knows how valuable saudi arabia is but um iran is sort of the wild card to me in this whole thing because they're hiding under bricks because they know they're going to need uh, a sanctuary when this all goes down because they're the uh the pro they're the propagators of all the problems quite frankly with respect to iraq and <clears throat> many other things they're the big brother right we always talk about this big brother of iraq so their tentacles have always been on their little brother that have kept them down you've got a currency with them that they call the toman in country and out of the country real which is most commonly known as um, it's sanctioned to death by the us and ofac office of foreign assets control military uh, financial cops uh, which we've discussed before so they're they're really they're stuck. They they need a way through this. But their problem is they've been the problem in all this. And so, um, yeah, the, the thing here that we're looking for, interestingly enough, David, I, I don't know if you know this already. I think we talked about this offline, but uh, Russia and Iran met this week secretly. So yeah. I'm going to be watching closely to see what happens this weekend and next week. Um, because two things that, that I'm watching for them for pri primarily um, is they're going to inflame everything on purpose, both in the Red Sea and the Strait of Hormuz. That's going to spike the oil prices, which we all know, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, who's going to spike it? You're saying the Iranians are going to deliberately create a situation to force the prices up? Yes. Yeah, yeah they're okay. going to create blockades in the Red Sea and Strait of Hormuz. Yeah, they've done um, it before. But... It's not the first time they've done it, and it's exactly what happened. There's often every right. five, four, five years, there's a little incident in that small part of the world. Right. Because <clears throat> they need to make income in other ways because their currency is so um, land based right now. And but they've like you said, they've done it before. Uh, but what will be interesting is all eyes are going away from Ukraine and going away from Israel and now coming back to where it should be, which is the Middle East. So they're in the thick of it. Right. So when that happens, what we're watching for, we've discussed this before, is Israel to make their grave mistake by hitting, bombing the the secret private uh, nuclear power plants that exist within Iran. You're going to see all these gases go up in the air. It's going to be chaos and panic. Boy, David, where have we heard this before? Kuwait, <laughs> 30 plus years ago when they bombed the oil fields. History yeah, repeats. Yeah. It's, if you don't know your history, you're doing to repeat it, right? The old axiom. <clears throat> so Iran plays... Um, pivotally a role in in a kind of two front way as i've been describing um you know both financially and geopolitically to create all this stuff once that happens they're going to flee for shelter uh into the bricks which they're already starting to do right but really they're going to need the u.s military at the end of the day because BRICS is not going to deal um i don't think with a sanctioned country until they're cleaned up so again, there's good and bad sides. Uh, it's not the people, obviously, it's the governance like it, like it always is. Um, but once that bombing happens, you're going to see a lot of things happen with Iraq. You know, nobody, people aren't gonna be looking at Iraq, they're gonna be looking at Israel and Iran and all that area. There, it's, that's the time when people take their focus off Iraq that it'll happen. Again, a suddenly moment, right? And <clears throat> what we're looking for is the next, I, I don't, we always talk about it's not not about dates and rates. But I'm looking at a sequence of, of puzzle events. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm looking for is if they do something this weekend or next week, somewhere in the next, you know, five seven plus days, then we will see these events start to transpire quickly because they've already been queued up, right? Everything is staged. So we would see potentially in the next. 10 to 20 days, roughly, some uh, towards the end of this month, 
see these events transpire. And then again, once Iraq puts their stuff in parliament, which cues up the oil stuff in the, in the, in the oceans and the nuclear bombing that happens, boom, we're within days to weeks of the revaluation happening because when things seem at their worst, God will free his people. They haven't gotten bad enough yet, but when they reach that climax, which they're about to, then we're, we're, we're where we need to be finally. The thing about, I followed all that, John, and the <clears throat> points in there, I don't disagree with any of it, but there's other points I'd like to put inside the cake, put a bit more ingredients in there. You yeah, see, please. Iran, Iran was a country before, in the 1960s and 70s, it was a great place. They had ski resorts, they had beach resorts. It was open it was free. Women could wear what they want. There wasn't any restrictions. And then they have a revolution and the Islamic State took over. The Ayatollah moved in and then it all changed. Then they became the enemy of the world. And they've been subjected to several, well, absolutely constant campaigns of evil and, you know, playing scary music whenever you see someone from Iran. I've met literally hundreds of Iranian people and I think they're lovely. Again, regimes are the ones that make the decisions, not the people. Now, it does have a significant amount of oil. They've always struggled with the refinery production. And this is where some of the other countries have stepped in, such as China, such as Russia, trying to say, okay, look, we'll give you the technology to refine the oil, but obviously you give us preferential customer uh, list treatment, and we'll go from there. So the West, the USA, America, um, UK, Great Britain, has always bastardized these people by saying they're evil, they're, you know, they're is extreme fundamentalists, they're launching campaigns of bombing and blowing up embassies around the world. Now, I'm not going to tell you it didn't happen, but now we've learned so much about how false flags are created to create an event to force the hand of whoever the oppressor or the aggressor, aggressor is. I've been hearing rumors about a false flag blowing up a ship down there, John, and they're going to blame it on the Iranians, but it's not really them. It was a, a sacrifice. It was another um, slaw lamb to the slaughter, sacrificial, to incite this problem. But there's one other incident that's going on, John, which I think could change things, could speed things up a bit. And this is South Africa's incident right now. They're taking Israel into the courts of human rights and war crimes tribunal tomorrow and there's so many countries that have backed it so this could speed things up from this point of view which could be a very interesting catalyst because i think this is the match that's going to start the fire to get things rolling a bit faster now yeah. here's the other thing and this is where holding currency in your hand is important because if it does get crazy, I mean, it, it won't really affect me living in the middle of Spain, but a lot of people it will. If you, if everything goes down and you've got everything invested in banks or stocks and shares, we're going to get to a significant event that they're predicting for next week with a larger banks. Holding hard, cold, hard currency in your hand is definitely something you, you've got to consider. And this is why I love these countries, because as things do change, their currency is going to increase. And if you don't believe me in things like this, I can remember when it was $2 for one English pound. Now it's about 120, 130, I think. But it used to be double. It's because the American dollar was weak. The pound was strong against it. And we were all buying dollars with our pounds. You know, we were doubling our money, sitting on for a while and then using it again to buy something. So it's going to be a very interesting week. You're tying all this in to Iran being forced to play their cards at the table. And again, they're going to have to turn to BRICS because who else is going to protect them? They do have right. a significant number of military personnel and they're not exactly going to be a pushover, but compared to a superpower, obviously. But Russia's already aligned itself because of the petroleum industry and the refineries. So they're not such an easy pushover. This could be very interesting, John. Well, that's a great point that you made, David. I hadn't considered, you know, that aspect of Iran that you were just discussing. But also you have to consider the other element of it here in the U.S. Um, as our economy continues to fail and the wheels come off of it, which we all know is inevitable, the deep state's going to look for someone to blame. And Iran or Syria would be the perfect scapegoat, as they typically yeah. are. 
I don't think most people are going to buy it, especially the people that watch, you know, these podcasts already know, but I'm talking about the contingency of, of the mainstream of society is going to start to realize, no, we've seen this before. This is, you know, I'm looking at my, my, my grocery bill, my gas bill, my electric bill, uh, you know, blaming some country out in the Middle East doesn't really cut it, you know, because that's blaming, not. They were blaming Putin. Putin's the reason that fuel is so expensive. In yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's pathetic, quite frankly. But um, but I but I think Iran plays the, the wild card in this whole thing, which is why I wanted to, to focus on them. Yeah, a little, yeah. A little bit more in Saudi Arabia as far as the catalyst, as you said. So. Let's move on to Saudi Arabia. Have we got it in perfect. here? Yes, we have. Saudi perfect, Arabia. perfect segue. I mean, yeah. Saudi Arabia, <laughs> so, boy, it's almost like you knew what you were doing. <laughs> Um, Saudi Arabia is a little bit more obvious, you know, I mean, everybody knows they're one of the top, if not the top oil producers in the Middle East. Um, but don't forget, Iraq is is right there. They're actually number two. People don't realize that. Uh, just, I mean, people know they have oil, but maybe not realize just how powerful they are in the Middle East, respective to Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia has been the kingpin here. Um, they were the first one to join the BRICS. So that's not a big surprise. Um, but what's interesting about Saudi Arabia, which you already know, is that um, they already have come out and said, you know, alongside Iraq, it, we're not we're not we're de-dollarizing. We're not dealing with the petrodollar anymore. We're going to the petro yuan. Uh, it's it, the, the key to this whole thing is this. This isn't we talked about this before just for the audience that hasn't heard this. This is an east west reset. So what that in essence means is the power that was with the West, with the deep state, with the dollar. The, the thing that we always had in the US is our military and the dollar, but we no longer have that. And yeah. as the rest of the world is realized that and pivoted away, we're going to a East-West reset and an asset-backed reset, meaning whatever your country produces, gold, silver, crops, diamonds, oil, that's what's gonna be the contingency of the value in which you trade. So Saudi Arabia has been actively leading the way in that to get away from the deep state dollar and and separate themselves and and pretty much put their their flag in in the ground you know demonstratively that they are not dealing with the dollar anymore. Um, but what's interesting is that they did that and then Iraq has now come up and said as of January first, as we discussed before, we're not dealing with dollars inside or outside a country either. So Saudi Arabia obviously is one of the 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 foundational critical elements of of the BRICS and of the East West reset. That's really the main point I wanted to, to convey. Now I've got some history to add to Saudi Arabia. It used to just be called Arabia, and it, the British during World War Two and afterwards deliberately started making the trying to um, figure out how they're going to control the entire country. So they offered the deal to the Saudi family. And they managed to um, unite the tribes out there because they're all fighting over it. So it was a British-controlled, British-built, British creation. But they they needed to control the oil. And this has been going on for years. So the Saudi Arabia, you can see photographs of all of the Saudi sheikhs messing about, shaking hands with politicians in both the UK and the USA. And they were treated as royalty. They kissed their asses. The Americans and the Brits kissed their asses. Whatever they wanted, they got because they're after the oil. Now, the USA, the deal that they struck to get this family into power was, okay, you need to do all your deals in US dollars. And it's literally trillions of dollars a year. But the Saudis said, we're not doing that anymore. We're not going to use the US dollar and all of this. And you imagine if every single transaction you take 10 cents of profit on, on one sense of profit, if there's trillions and trillions of barrels of oil being transported around the world, all done in dollars from Singapore and all the other trade hubs around the world, forget it. And it was made obvious this because when Russia was put under sanctions during uh, COVID and recently during the Ukraine incident, the Russians offered Saudi Arabia a deal on diesel. They said, we'll supply with all your domestic diesel at a price that you can't even produce it for. So the Saudi government said, that's a great idea. We'll do that. And then what happened was the Saudi rebarreled it and rebadged it, changed the containers and the ships and still exported it to the West. So Putin's oil still got out. Very smart move. Saudi Arabia had a really good deal, but they've joined very uh, strongly now with Russia. And this is where this BRICS alliance comes in. 
Now, between that and Iraq, the one of the other largest producers of oil in the world saying, no more petrol dollars, we're not doing it. It's basically like cutting off cutting off alcohol to an alcoholic. It's absolutely going to starve them. The financial implications of this, they haven't really even addressed yet because the American government are just saying, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. No, this is a huge deal. This is a massive loss of revenue around the world. And also for the deep state, a massive loss of channels they can use for smuggling and black marketing and all of the illicit business that we're doing because the gateway to the Middle East back and forth for trading what they were doing before is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. I don't know where, they, where they're going to go next, John. How are they going to make up this shortfall of income? But again, holding on to currencies like this, it's, it's an absolutely brilliant idea because you're just sitting there waiting for the, for the ball to land on your number at the casino. And it's mm -hmm. going to come in there one time. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, if you're exactly if you're diversified and, and we've talked about this before, again, not to be redundant, but um, the wealth transfer has already been underway. This is just the next iteration of that wave. Right. And so you the way I look at it is and I'm not a, I'm not a, a gambler. I'm not a poker player, but I you know I have friends that are and they always talk about it, and what they work on, because, you know, I'm not good at that. I, I, you know, when to hold them, when to fold them. Right. And it's just not one of my strengths, but I have some friends that are and. They, they talk about this when I explain <clears throat> the financial stuff to them. They, their understanding in, in poker parlance is uh, it's like being at the craps table when you have markers down at every single position. So between the currencies, the bonds, precious metals, cryptos, um, exotic bonds, which we've talked about, Zimbabwe and Chinese bonds and the like, uh, even, you know, real estate, you know, oil stocks, uh, uh, you know, owning things, becoming your own central bank land, uh, buying land that has natural resources on it, such as oil, and natural gas, a water source, yeah. heirloom seeds. Those are markers down on the table. What you're just positioning yourself across the board. So as those, you know, puzzle pieces move, you can move laterally with that wave and capitalize for yourself, your family, your friends, your community, respectively. So, like you said, um, it's it's really advisable to be as uh, pre-positioned as you can possibly be. Yeah, and that's the beauty of this because <clears throat> our job is is to share our information and try to guide people through this maze of misinformation. It's a model. So our job is to share what we've learned along the way and get the audience to understand what we're talking about. And I think we're doing a very good job, actually, because we're slowing it right down. The PowerPoint tonight has helped a lot because it's showing exactly what's going on. And also, it's it's us marking um, the cards, as they say. It's giving you a tip on what to do. Okay, listen, if you can do it, this would be a really good idea. We'll move on, John. You ready? Yeah, before we move on, real quick, uh, just go back, if, if you would, if you would. To your point, which was really a good one, um, we're giving them the information. It's not our machinations. You know, we've we've done our diligence. We we both consult with people that are smarter than we and w work on our learning and intel curve as much as possible. Because, like yeah, you said, you yeah. want to talk on a with regularity, and it's to iron sharpening iron, like Proverbs says. But it's not just us. You can look at the links that are right here on the PowerPoint, and you can click on those. But it isn't just a matter of reading the articles. It's one thing to read the article. It's another thing to understand what's really being said and how to break it down. And, and the way a militia man does, for example, and analyze what it really means, what the real implications are, what the, the long range 30,000 foot view of that information, what does it all mean? It's one thing to get the information. It's another thing to understand it and its implications you know, globally. And I think that's one of the things that you and I team up really well to do to the best of our ability is give people uh, a very, you know, sort of bottom line grassroots. This means this means this, and this is how it impacts this, which impacts you and yeah. what you're interested in or what you're working towards. So, yeah, I mean, we started off just having a chat, but the reaction mm -hmm. we had from the audience, you watching is looking for more clarity and, and a little, I would say, I'll use the word guidance, just a little nudge, you know, have a little look down there because it's not going to make any difference to me or, or John, what you do with this information. But I know I sleep better at night knowing that I've done my best to, to show people and share people what I've learned along the way. So I know you do too, John. 
Yeah, I mean, again, before we move on, David, um, the whole reason I got into this is coming from behind the scenes is I want God's people giving people to win. That's the reason I'm sticking my neck out. It isn't for <laughs> ego or ratings or any of that stuff. It really isn't. I because I would have done that a long time ago if that were the case. I just I just want God's people to win and do the best of my ability to give that information, like you said, give people a sense of calm, a sense of clarity, a sense of yeah. direction to get away from all the white noise of today, 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 tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, I mean, come on. You know, how many of that those dates have to come and go or people throwing stress balls and clown balloons at you do you need to hear before you're like, you know what, enough. I need to to get just people just want truth. They just yeah. want practical, straightforward, no nonsense truth that makes sense and gives them their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. And that's what we're working to our best ability to help them yeah, do. That, that's not based on folklore and fairy tales. These are hard facts. You can look up any of this. This is why I like John's research and your research team are very good, mate. Are you yeah, ready to move on? The next I am. One? Yeah. It's a phenomenal team that works beside me. I'm telling you. It's, it's really know. the two bad guys in the room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is a this this was one that I really wanted to focus with you on in your in your listeners, Dave, because um, <clears throat> to me this is <clears throat> excuse me intriguing and riveting at the same time. So uh, here's a name that everybody should know, like him or not, doesn't really matter. The man's got influence, right? Elon Musk, yeah. And he said what we've been talking about 2024 is going to be a crazy roller coaster. And what has he said in his X article? The gold standard, the BRICS nations, the Iraq dinar revaluation or reinstatement, calling it an RI, which he understands because this has happened before. And RV is meant for the countries that never revalued, right? Like Indonesia, okay? Or uh, Thailand and countries like that. But Iraq has, has been here before, right? From what we've discussed. So that's the difference between a reinstatement and reevaluation for those who may not know or didn't think about that. The Epstein Black Book, we've already seen that coming out more and more and more. Uh, Ukraine and Israel, we've discussed that. Um, but now we get into a very, very important discussion. China's annexing Taiwan. So I had this discussion again with SG and several other guests on my side. Um, I've been watching this for a while. So as you know, David, I'm going to be interested to see your geopolitical counterpoint on this discussion with respect to Taiwan, they're supposed to have, as I understand it, Taiwanese elections two days from now on the 13th, which is pretty significant. Now, what we have to differentiate right off the bat, mate, is that there's two sides to China. There's the CCP side yeah. and there's the public. They're totally different. It's like one, it's like twins, a bad twin and a good twin. So we need to differentiate. People think a lot of people, not everybody, a lot of people think mainstream was, oh, China's the bad guy, they're the bully, you're going to go into Taiwan and create havoc. This is a staged event. And it's also going to be, I believe, a very quick one. It reminds me a lot of the Iraq Gulf War, where they just rode around in tanks for a day or two, and then it was over. It was more like a theater show. I think this is going to be the same thing. But this isn't the CCP going in. This is G going in with the Republic to do what I call Ukraine 3.0. We had Ukraine, we have Israel, now we have this. This is going to be the cleanup operation, pedophilia, yeah. sex trafficking, money laundering, all the usual stuff. But what people don't see in this, and this is why I'm so passionate about this, this event, David, make no mistake about it, and I hope the audience really remembers this, this event, beyond that, singularly helps Vietnam break out of communism enough for their Vietnamese dong, which I believe is the most valuable currency, you know, pound for pound, no pun intended, um, getting the most value for it, right, uh, as, compo as compared to the dinar. You get so much more for it because it's been so suppressed and controlled, right? But as we've discussed, 34% GDP, we got the most best and most Brent crude in their, in their oil, in their, in their oceans. They've got silver, plethoras of silver. They've got you know, gold and platinum and many other assets. They're a very secretive country. Their problem isn't economic, unlike Iraq. Their problem is corruption. So this begets that issue by rooting out the corruption enough. She didn't get 100% of it, but if you got 70 to 80%, that's more than enough to free them up to come out 
in this annexation, right? As, as Elon puts it. And that frees up Vietnam for what people were waiting for to the one two punch of the dinar to the dong. They should be watching this event because it's going to be a very quick and suddenly moment where they free this up and you're going to see Vietnam change fairly radically um, once this event happens. That's why I think this this conflict is so this event is so important to highlight. Yeah, the Taiwanese, you you're you're on the you're over target there, John. It's the Asian Ukraine, basically. It's been manipulated by the deep state for years. And look at look at the manufacturing they do, all the electronics. They're absolutely essential in the entire production world's production of electronic components, mostly chips and memory chips, microchips, servo chips, 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 chips. So where's all that silver come from? Across the water, it comes from Vietnam. So they're all tied in together. Because remember, when they need the solder, they do need silver in manufacturing as well as gold. Um, I think it'll be very quick. I think it's a matter of, again, cutting the head off and the, the tail off of the dragon so the funds can't be misappropriated because how easy is it to smuggle and transfer money? Oh, you know, we bought 50,000 chips and there were $50 million. You know what I mean? And how big was, oh, there was the whole, there was 50 of them in a box like that, you know. You can't tell how much a chip is worth. If a customs agent opened a box of chips, he would think, you know, what the hell is this? Looks like someone smashed up a DVD player. It's the ideal product for smuggling and transferring money and cleaning money because you can set up a fictitious factory in Taiwan producing specialized electronic components, which are microscopic. Fund a load of money through there, get your trial trafficking funds in place, and it's the ideal business. So it does need to be cleaned up. Now, again, what you said, John, Chinese, what they portray to the public that they're a controlled society, I think is true. I don't think they're lying about that. There's too many Westerners. My friend's son was out there and he said it is like that. He said he couldn't get anything, couldn't buy anything. He was they they took his phone off him when he landed. He had to have a, an extra phone smuggled in. Um, but then again, behind the scenes, we know that the communists have approached the White House to saying, listen, the Chinese party. We want to get them out. We're not into this anymore. We want peace. Because at the end of the day, most, again, if you talk to any civilian from any country, they just want peace. They just want to be left alone. Look, I want to raise my family. I want to sit there with my grandchildren. I want to have a cup of tea and not be worried if there's a missile coming through the window or the roof. So, again, you're right, John. It'll be a very fast, decisive action. I, I don't know if it's going to be as quick as Desert Storm. But I don't think it'll go on as long as the Ukrainian in the conflict right now. And then into no. Vietnam. Look, look, you're right with Vietnam because look what happened. Let's go back to the 60s and 70s and beyond and before. A lot of people don't know that the British were in Vietnam. They tried to take it over. Then it was the French. They tried to take it over. And then it was handed the the baton was handed to the Americans in the 60s and 70s. Is okay, you guys have a go. Because we've screwed it all up. We can't control them. French is a second language in Vietnam. A lot of people don't know that. So why are all these Western countries all looking to Vietnam? Is it because they cared about the people and their well-being? No. I mean, those days, communism was spreading through, but the communism wanted it as well for its, for its vast resources of raw materials. America got in there, screwed up the economy. You divided the country, came, gave it back, and... Um, cleverly keep them all under sanctions for, for contracting and military um, sanctions, keep the military low, and also keep the exports in the range where they want to go, driving the economy down, driving the value the, of the local currency down, and keeping them as basically a private work slave country as best they can. But these things are going to change as we've been discussing because, again, the freedom and sovereignty is going to be handed back to these nations and once things are made public, how wealthy they are and what they've got, because it's all shh, like you say, John, it's a very secretive country. Don't talk about that mine. Don't talk about this discovery. We're not disclosing how many million trillion barrels of oil we've got. Interesting. So, Indeed. yeah. Indeed. So I think we can move on from there. <clears throat> oh, oh. So, you know, the infamous bank failures and closures. This to me has a, it's another two-headed monster, David, because <clears throat> you have to look at things with duality, right? We've discussed that. 
we all know, and you, know, you can see here, 64 U.S. bank branches announced closure in a single week. J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, right? Bank of America. Uh, on the right here, Daily Mail, uh, 1500, more than 1,500 branches in 2023. And that number is just going to accelerate. But as you know, this past summer when I sent you those pictures and others, you could see that you're you're seeing a uh, I call it an accordion effect when you when you pull an accordion out and it has to recoil back in or a slinky what have you as a visual, uh, it's enfolding into itself. So you're seeing a lot of the banks close their their unnecessary branches that are sort of secondary tertiary branches and just you know consolidating people. It's inconvenient for people, but um, really what's going on is they're as you saw pivoting towards wealth management centers because yeah. that's all going to be needed as we're going to a, again, you know, is the digital economy a good thing? Short term, yes. Bad term, long term, no. Right. But the whole point of this, as I've told people, is become your own central bank. So you're self-sufficient. So that doesn't even affect you. There'll be a window of time where this will be a benefit and then you're out of it. Right. And I think that's, you know, before 2030, we have a little window of time here to take advantage of this. But thanks to the Lord. <clears throat> but ultimately, you know, as that digital economy is being ushered in and it's already really here, right? And you have the new system, you know, dovetailing the old and they just transition. Um, you're seeing the need for branches decrease. And the only reason they're keeping branches open is primarily uh, for the uh, wealth management centers for these express purposes. So people have to understand why banks are closing. There's really a couple of reasons for that. Now, this gentleman, I sent you a video. I know you, you did this one of your other shows. He's saying that uh, J.P. Morgan is apparently filing for bankruptcy on January 23rd, less than two weeks from now. You know, could be that date, could be a later date. Uh, who knows? But but we know that it's it's definitely <clears throat> it's definitely coming. That J.P. Morgan is you know, <laughs> as I call him, Jamie Demon, uh, is you know attacking cryptos endlessly, attacking things endlessly. What he's really saying is, I don't want this to happen because I'm losing control. That's the real message behind it. Forget what he says. It's what he means, right? While he has subjugated, I mean, you know, I've, I've seen, and I think you have too, I've seen those Epstein flight logs years ago. And he was on some of those flights. Of so, course. Of course. so he's trying his best. This is a PR move to, to steer people away from his nefarious ways and lifestyle. Not unlike many of these scumbag bankers, but he's notoriously one of the worst. And so uh, <clears throat> all this is culminating into, you know, the bank failures, uh, the bank reshuffling, uh, wealth management centers. It all points to the fact of the reset and that you need to become your own central bank. That's really, in, in short parlance, what I wanted to convey to you and your followers. Yeah, I mean, just look at some of the headlines. 64 U.S. bank branches announced shocking closures in a single weeks. I'll, I'll throw a little... 10 cents in there you see a lot of the branches are closing because people don't use them anymore it's one people don't use checks anymore they're not accepting cash from the businesses business has gone out of business they don't have them anymore but we know we've seen several i mean at least in the in the teens and uh, and high uh, mid to high 20s of wells fargo's banks being completely transformed inside they've been spending money on a refurb and they've been installing rooms in there with glass partitions so you have a private room it looks more like a lawyer's office, really, with all different meeting rooms in there than it ever does a bank. So what are they doing that for? It's because this new distribution of wealth that they know is coming, they're hoping to get a, a very large slice of that pie. And yep. if they continue with the friendly attitude, I mean, I've dealt with Wells Fargo. I've had a couple of accounts there. I, I, I don't remember them ever being bad. I remember the staff being very personal and friendly and nice. Um. I don't think some of the other ones, I've no faith in Bank of America. I have no yeah. faith in Chase. But if I was going to put a, a dollar bet on anybody, it would be Wells Fargo in my books. And once these big funding, you see, JP Morgan and all Goldman Sachs, they're basically thieves in suits. Mm -hmm. They've been tricking and sneaking and lying for decades, for generations, robbing from Peter to pay Paul all the trust funds and hedge funds is, are all based on how to make as much money. Who can we exploit? And all of this wealth distribution is going to be redistributed in the right direction. So if you imagine everything's going to do a total reverse, the bad becomes the good, whoop, and the, the good become the bad. What they told you before is 
all of this is going to come out. All of these people are going to flip. And then it's going to be countries like Vietnam, like Iraq, and like um, Zimbabwe, the breadbasket that people are going to rely on. And this is where things are going to change. So, mm. you know, we're going to be Zimbabwe, biggest importer of 2030, eh, exporter of 2030. Don't be surprised to start hearing these headlines, especially right. because they've all been tagged in with the BRICS economy, which is a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. They're trying to help each other. You know, a, a really good point you made, David, too. And I, I, I'd like to just, <clears throat> like you've done with me, we compliment each other, add to the backs of what you said. Um, this is a really important point. We're going to see, this is the year of shock and awe, right? 2024. Yeah. Everything that everybody said would never happen. The dinar will never happen. The dollar will never fail. You know, Zimbabwe won't happen. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. All these haters yeah. and detractors, all these knuckleheads. All that means is that it's ready to happen because everything that once happened never was told would never happen cell phones electricity air conditioning cars computers you name it right that was all said to be unthinkable we the same trope that these haters do over and over and over and then they're always proven wrong and they never come out and apologize they never admit they're just so filled with pride and and, and enmity that's their own undoing but we're going to have a period of time this year mate where we're going to have shock and awe in another element because there's going to be a period of time as these currencies reinstate revalue as the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous as we do an east west reset it's a whole ideological shift right and financial yeah. what else does that mean it also means there's a period of time where we will not know what things are worth everything's yeah. be upside down right there's going to be a period of latency where we don't know what's a cup of coffee worth what's a gallon of gas worth uh, what's a pair of shoes worth and that's a necessary process to, to get us where we need. When Trump said we're going to have bumps in the road, I think that's one of the many things he was alluding to. And you were talking about uh, bankers being, you know, crooks in suits. Years ago, you know, we all have those articles of clothing that we wish we had held on to for personal or sentimental reasons. I had a T-shirt years ago. It was an image of the same guy in with four squares on the front. And it said banker, broker, lawyer, crook. <laughs> yeah yeah the same suit. <laughs> yeah yeah same same guy same suit so you know yeah. to your point <laughs> yeah so watch the headlines again little tips folks there's a lot going on whether this story of the jp morgan fine for bank bankruptcy is going to happen on this date john and myself both agree on camera and off camera we don't like talking about dates mm -hmm. but they've been it's happened before they got bailed out before you know they went under goldman sachs JP Morgan all got hit hard. What year was that, John? 2008? Yeah, 2008. The bail-in. They all yeah. got hit hard with the American mortgage scandal. You don't think it can happen again? It will. And it's it's way overdue. Everybody that I know that invests in Wall Street is saying, holy shit, it's never seen it so high. But oh my God, I'm nervous it's going to happen every any day. They all well, talk about a crash. Sorry, what they also want to do, David, which is important to denote in this discussion, is they want to use the Dodd-Frank bill they created in 2006. What a coincidence. They put it in 06, and then it all starts to unravel in 08. They want to reverse engineer that to do to use Dodd-Frank to do bail-ins. That's, that's their goal. But yeah. just like bail CB... Bail-ins for the sake of the audience is when they go into your... Not just your savings and your actual liquidity, but they'll, they'll use your commodities and your assets... Because they'll say, listen, we're bankrupt. We need $150 billion. Okay, let's go help ourselves to the assets and, and items of value that our customers have. We're going to take that. And then the small print of your contract, when you clicked agreed or signed it, if you've had the account that long, they've told you they can do it. And, of course, nobody reads these. Nobody reads them. So be careful what you do. It's difficult for John and myself to give you financial advice. Take yeah. your money in, put your money out, buy this. We're not telling you to do that at all. All we're telling you and showing you is what worldwide events are brewing and, and bubbling and stewing to. And for very little money, you can protect yourself by buying hard currency that you can hold on to mm. with countries that are about to explode with new economic success. <clears throat> Bottom line, it's easy to understand. John, do you need anything else on that page? No, nope, we're good. We're good. We'll move on. Texas. 
So this is another thing I wanted to talk about. So I'm sure a lot of people here in America <clears throat> are, are fairly aware of this, but uh, it's been bantied about for a while that Texas was going to be the first state to adopt the gold standard with their own digital gold back coin. Um, a lot of us thought it was going to happen last year, but as you can see with this article, it looks like they're working towards March to, to, pass, it into, to pass it into legislation to be active. And what that's going to do is allow Texas to secede from the union, going back to our history and our constitution. I, I can almost assure you, David, there's going to be at least 30 other states, maybe more, should be more, that will jump on board and do the exact same thing, right? And I know Tennessee is going to be one of them, which is one of the many other reasons I want to be there, because they're always constitutionally, um, sounds kind of paradoxical, but forward, backward thinking and, and, and keeping the structure of, of, of America and the constitutional principles, Bill of Rights intact. But Texas is leading the way, and it looks as of right now, they're going to be, by March, uh, implementing this into legislation to move forward. Uh, there was also a point where Texas is working towards joining the BRICS. I don't know if you knew that. I did know pretty... that because it's, it's, it's <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's an absolutely immense economy. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got the same economy as what country was it? Somewhere like it's close to Germany. The, the economy it's got is huge. So if they were to pull out the support that the, the rest of the federal government get from the taxes paid in Texas, Texas taxes, it would cripple them. It's like a stomach punch. You'd never get up for a while after that. And also the, the basic attitude in Texas of the people is, you know what? They are cowboys. They're tough, no shit taking people. It's a massively yeah. red state. And they're yeah. sick of all of this um, foreign yeah. agenda and getting their boys in. And they also have a very substantial amount of citizens of Texas and the armed forces, John, their military would be would be a substantial threat or a danger if anybody was to be stupid enough to mess with Texas. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. And you'd have to be a knucklehead to do that. But uh, you're not going to work out well for you. But by joining the BRICS and seceding from the union and doing this gold coin, they're putting themselves out of the corporation into essentially the Constitution. They're seceding. They could become their own country quite frankly. And they have the, the means, the manpower, the resources, as you said, to do so. But it establishes a critical precedent for many other states in the country to do the exact same thing and pull away from D.C. and that wicked corporation, which is being eviscerated as we speak. Well, Texas is a really good example of that because look, look at their southern border. They're being invaded. The people are really fed up with it. The federal government isn't helping. They're making it worse by cutting down the wires and basically, you know, it's, it's like a, a an airport nighttime runway for people just coming into the country legally. And at some point, the people are going to snap. It's like at a, it's like in your taxes situation. Why am I paying all this money for these guys? There was a very funny German situation. I'll just mention it briefly. That a German chancellor, a German um, senator in Europe said. Why should Germany pay for all of these lazy Spanish, Italians, and Greek people, Portuguese people who not do nothing but take siestas and spend money on their mistresses? <laughs> Texas has the same attitude, saying, "Why are we paying for all of these, you know, New Yorkers and yeah. in the north, and then California liberals?" California, yeah. California liberals, they've had enough of it. So you know what? I'd say they're that close. Depending on what happens as we get closer to November, I would not be surprised if Texas just, you know, took one huge chainsaw and cut themselves off and floated themselves out into the Gulf. I think that's going to happen way before that, as far as the, the gold um, standard for them. But yeah, I mean, the rest of it remains to be seen. But big changes. Don't forget that President Trump during 2020 and all of that gave states the ability to see, see, to make their own decisions and secede from the union. So Texas rightly took advantage of that. Yeah, I don't blame them. I mean, they're a very wealthy no. state. They've got the oil, they've got the gold, they've got some great natural resources. No. One more, John, we've got one more slide to share, yeah? I do, I believe we do, yes. Oh, yeah. Conclusion or final this, comments. This is kind of the closing, you know, um, prayer, basically. One of my favorite verses, Hebrews 11.1. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, of the evidence of things not yet seen. So a lot of people tend to go with what their physical eyes, what they can see at this level, 
but you have to understand that there's, like you said, so much that goes on behind the scenes, so much that goes above what we can see every day. We're not all perfect. We don't all have the answers. So if we can acknowledge that, then surely we need to move beyond what we just see in the temporal moment of each day, right? You take it day by day, but you also have to understand that you don't have the whole picture. And that's what you and I do our level best to do is, you know, kind of pull the veil back and create more openings to what's going on behind the scenes that people may not be aware of. And more importantly, how those pieces interplay together. Um, and, and, you know, just paying homage to the late great Kim Clement, who was one of the most accurate prophets of our, of our modern era. Um, interesting that he, remember he said, when things seem at their worst, I'll free my people. But he also said, what's going on now, David? And this is right up your alley with geopolitical. The Israel right from situation. February 1, we saw with Japan, earthquakes. We oh, had yeah, some here in yeah, California, yeah, yeah. Indonesia. We're seeing a systemic amount of earthquakes worldwide happening almost simultaneously. He said through the Lord that the earth will shake and shake again. So we're seeing the shaking physically, financially, politically, across the board, spiritually. In the churches, out of the churches, we're seeing shakeups and shocks and, and um, demarcations of all types. So a lot of his prophecies have come to pass. He said that President Trump would be president back in April of 07. And two weeks after President Trump was, was appointed, he passed away. So he was able to get to see that in the natural. So I just wanted to kind of pay homage to him and any final comments that you want to make. Yeah, his work is interesting. I think he looks like Russell Crowe. <laughs> Reminds me of Russell Crowe. His work is interesting. Um, I've watched quite a few of these clips and his predictions are spot on. So yeah, I think that's a, a nice final slideshow there, John. What we're going to do is we're going to put a link below. If you want to get hold of any of the currencies we've provided a company that we work with personally. Um, it's there below. Click on it. You'll get the information you need. You can purchase a little bit. You can purchase a lot. It's entirely up to you. Our mission, and John and myself have discussed this, is to arm you with the truth so you can step into the armor if you want to. You can step out or you can put a little bit on a lot on. It's entirely up to you. But we both have these currencies, John and myself. I'm actually going to Vietnam this month, actually early next month. <clears throat> I'm going to go down there and have a little look around because I'm kind of convinced it's going to happen pretty soon. But I'm not just going for that. But something's drawing me to Vietnam, John. I've never had that feeling. What the hell do I want to go to Vietnam for? Food's good, but I'm not, you know, I'm not into surfing. I'm not into um, on that particular culture. I like the temples. So. The links are below. If you need any more information, you can click on that and get everything you need. And we're going to be updating you next month, John, no? Yes, sir. It's about the same time next month. Um, where we're going to go next, we don't know. We just planned this a few days before because we watch worldwide events and how things are shaping up. Maybe there's going to be a different country that's going to come on. There are several others. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't talk about Venezuela today. That's always um, a good popular one. There's some other interesting countries in South America. Ecuador, for example, right now is under martial law. What's going on there? You know, Salvador, the president of Salvador is forced out and he's imprisoned thousands of gang members. Nicaragua is another interesting for me, communist country that's coming up through the ranks. So maybe we'll do a few different countries next month to see how things are going, John. But in the meantime, the countries that we focused on today, which is Vietnam, Zimbabwe, Iraq, we've touched on Iran, but that's really just because it's going to affect all of the situation in Iraq. Um, yeah, you, can get, you can get the information below. Just click it. John will put it on there for you. Sure. And, and you know, I'll obviously just to mop up because people, I'm sure you get it all the time. Yes, the boulevard is in the equation. Absolutely. They all 209 countries are. So there's no need to isolate anyone. They're, they're all going to go. Could talk about Argentina, how they just devalued their currency. Why would they be doing that? To destroy it and rebuild it, right? Yeah. I mean, you really think about it critically. There'd be a reason that Malay is doing that. Um, we watch Brazil. We, we watch, you know, Thailand is another one to watch because North and South Korea are going to eventually merge together their currencies. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a whole bunch of there's no one point. It's that they're they're so isolated and yet interconnected at the same time it's it's just it's 
it's one of the most paradoxical times I can remember in my history and probably yours as well. Absolutely. It's, and it's all these countries that have vast resources that the West have been deliberately keeping them down, saying, oh, no, 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 don't let don't let them get too rich because they'll get too strong. Now, my son has been living in Argentina for about five or six months. And he, I'll tell you the system before we go. So people understand this. He used to go down with cash in his hand and he would trade euros or dollars for local currency and he would get double on the black market than he would at the bank. If he used to put his card in and use an ATM, it was about, yeah, 45% less. Hmm. He'd get double trading it because every day the restaurant menus, had, they were adjusting it. Inflation was crazy. So they have to devalue it, take the zeros off. So it's actually controllable because it's spiraling out of control because of corruption, because of sanctions, because of debts that they owe for all hmm. of the other bullshit. You know, there was a communist dictator in there Pinuard, Pinyo in the 70s, and they're still paying off debts to get him out. Hmm. The political arms that stretch into these countries to keep their currency artificially low is being cut off. And we've shown you why. All the moves, all the waking up, all the people demanding truth and freedom and the sovereignty back is going to return the wealth to these countries. And you're sitting in a front row seat watching it, and it's going to be brilliant. John, you've done an outstanding job as usual, mate. The presentation was great. Thank you, sir. It's late for me now, so I'm going to go and have a bit of dinner. I'll have a glass of wine and wind down and absorb what we've discussed tonight. And uh, cool. I'll leave you to do the closing on the microphone. Is there anything you want to add to the show? Other than just, you know, it's you're picking a really interesting time to go to Vietnam, especially <laughs> when that happens. I pray that you're safe. So just be careful, yeah. you know. I'll go with the Texas attitude. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, mate. I'm, I'm I know how to fly helicopters and airplanes. I'll go straight in air base and steal one. <laughs> That's true. I, I I know that about you. Um, I mean, just other than just you know, be prepared, um, pray up, um, be proactive, do what you can do. Whether it's a little or a lot, it doesn't matter. Just get in the game. If you're not in it, if you're in the game, continue to improve your position. If you're able, yeah. um, help your neighbors, help your friends. Um, use discernment about who you share things with because, you know, a lot of people, it's amazing to me. I went to buy books yesterday at Barnes and Noble and you just, it's, it's palpable how you can watch the body language, right? Of people, David, and people can say, well, how do you see this? And I'm like, how can you not? It's like yeah. when you, know it, you can't unknow it. And it's, it's so breathtaking to me that when this happens this year, so many people are going to be like, what just happened? I didn't see this coming. It's like they just, and there's a lot of reasons, brainwashing, mind control. People are busy. People are in their jobs. People, you know, they're in the system. I get that. But it's just, it's amazing that you can't step out of your, 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 uh, your window or your world. You go to the grocery store. They're packaging six strawberries here in California for three bucks. That doesn't get your attention. The gas prices the uptick in, in oil or um, uh, electric bills, your car insurance going up. I mean, there's people that are just, um, you know, canceling their homeowner's insurance. I'm hearing that more and more from people just to, just to cut costs anywhere they yeah. can. So, you know, the fake news and, and this deep state economy, uh, deep state administration that's on its last legs, they can, they can try to BS people all they want that, you know, repackage it like they do food, that everything's fine. But I think the majority, and obviously everybody here knows, that's, that's as you would say, rubbish. And it's, rubbish. it's not the case. And, and I would also be, we can talk about this next month, um, but I'd be watching in February because I think the Biden, as the GOP continues to put pressure on him to be impeached or resign, they're going to make a way to try to save face for him and have him step down due to undisclosed medical reasons. But that's just all part of the plan to strip everything away and bring all the bad guys out to the light. So um, it may not feel like it. It may not seem like it, but feelings are subject to change. And we are winning this. And if you're still here and you're staying in the fight and you're persistent, you've already won to some degree and give yourself a break. Don't be too hard on yourself. You can't know everything. Nobody can. You, you take it day by day. We do our best. You do your best likewise. And, you know, for those who stick around and work with us, we'll work with them to, to yeah. get us to the finish line. That's what matters is getting to the finish line. 
Well done. It's a good a good point. Get them to the finish line. Get them over the finish line. Yeah. Well, folks, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that. You can always go back and rewatch it if you didn't catch anything. Click the links below if you want more information about anything we talked about. And we'll be, I suppose, back sometime next month with an update, John. Yeah. Yes, sir. Look forward to it. Thank you. Take care. We always talk a lot offline, so I'll probably call them in 20 <laughs> minutes and say, hey, there's one question I have. <laughs> Thank that you, folks. Take care. God bless.